afternoon. I have nothing at the top. Really? Happy Tuesday. No big announcements, huh? No big announcements. All right, let's start where we started pretty much every day for the last couple of uh, years, I think it must be now. Um, can you give us an update on any contacts you've had in the um, suspended communications channel between the United States and Russia? And I have nothing additional to So there's no... Yeah. There's no. Uh, there's been some suggestion of a of an ISSG meeting of some some type in this week. Is that something that's in the cards? I don't have anything on the secretary's schedule to speak to. Um, okay. Then um, this is Syria related, it, it, but it also has to do with Yemen. Over the weekend, you saw you, there was this <clears throat> airstrike on a on a funeral by the Saudi-led coalition. And I'm just wondering, does the administration see any difference between this kind of thing and what you accuse the Russians and the Syrians and the Iranians of doing in Syria, particularly Aleppo? Well, yeah, I think there are. Other than the Some support the Saudi coalition and don't support the Syrians and Russians? What, what are the other differences? Well, look, what. Well, there's a couple things, Matt. Um, the the strike over the weekend is being investigated, and the Saudis publicly said uh, that they were going to investigate this uh, as uh, you know for the potential of it being, uh, in fact, uh, wrongly implemented and wrongly executed. I haven't seen a single case in Syria where uh, the regime or the Russian military, after bombing civilian targets, deliberately uh, uh, and indiscriminately said, yeah, we're going to look into that. Uh, we're not sure that, it, you know, that we did that right. We're going we're to take a look at it. Not once. Not once. Um, but the Saudis are, and the, they're willing to admit that this could have been a mistake and that they're going to investigate that. And they've done that in the past. Um, so it is different. Uh, um, I think it's also important to remember uh, that uh, in the Saudis' case, uh, they, ha they are, their cities, their citizens are under very real, darn near daily threat uh, from missiles being launched on the Yemeni side of their border, missiles that are provided by Iran to the Houthi rebels. So. There is a there is this the, the pressing requirement for self defense to them um, right across the border that uh, certainly has um, driven much of uh, of their military activity uh, in Yemen in the past. Now, I do want to say, uh, and you saw our statement over the weekend, uh, we take this very seriously, um, and we have been nothing but candid and forthright with the Saudis about our concerns over civilian casualties and collateral damage and um, our concerns about lack of precision in the conduct uh, of some of these strikes. So I don't want to wave it off and say that the United States uh, isn't taking this very, very seriously, what, ha what happened in Yemen. As you, as, again, as you saw from the statement that the NSC issued, that, uh, that we're going to review. Uh, the aid and assistance that you pointed to in your question uh, that go to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, particularly, well, we always do in every case. We constantly review that aid and assistance, but in particular light of, of this strike over the weekend. So, yeah, there's some key differences. So, the, this, so you, you don't think that, despite the fact that no investigation has been completed yet, you're, you're sure that this was not deliberate? No, I didn't say that. Well, you, but you said that the Russian and Syrian attacks are deliberate. They are. Okay. They are. I'm, didn't, I'm, I'm, didn't, what I'm saying maybe, is, maybe I'm wrong on this, but didn't do you not regard the Russian call for an investigation into the attack on the aid convoy as a real thing? Uh, well, they, they can point to how real it is. I, uh, I've also seen they, they, they flip flop. Right. First, they said they they wanted an investigation, then they pulled it back. So it's not exactly been a, a clarion call. For an investigation, and what we're seeing in Aleppo is nothing but a concerted effort uh, over recent days to 
to take that city by force, to subdue it by force. This isn't, this isn't uh, indiscriminate, haphazard, accidental bombing of infrastructure. It's very deliberate. All right, Ms. Bain, I think this is probably my last one on this, but you, you, you pointed to the fact that the Saudis are doing this self-defense. Is that the not this one they the were, specific thing, but look, the whole, I, in, in so its they were, they were invited in by the Yemeni government. The right. Saudi-led coalition was invited in by the Yemeni government. Now, I know what you're going to say. Well, the Russians were invited by no, no, Syria, by no. Assad to do that. I no, get no, no, this. No, 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 I'm not trying to make too much of a historical I, analogy. I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to. Yes, they were. Yes, they, they were invited in by uh, the Yemeni government, and they are under th real threat yeah, on yeah. their side, on the on the Yemeni, Yemeni side of their, of their so border. You, the, 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 that wasn't where I was going with this, but you said that they're under threat, that the Saudis are under threat from missiles provided by Iran. And yet, at the same time, you surely you must understand that Yemeni civilians are increasingly at risk and being killed by weapons that the United States has furnished to the Saudis and their coalition partners in this. So you, you don't find that there's a, any kind of an issue with this? Because a lot of people of do, including, do, including on the Hill. So just because these no, no, missiles no, no, no. were made in Iran, I mean, they can, people on the ground in Yemen are looking at what's coming, raining down on them from the sky, and it says made in USA on it. Is that not a problem? Of course it's a problem, and that's why in our statement over the weekend, uh, issued by the National Security Council, that, that we're, that we're going to undertake right. a review so of that aid and assistance, of course it's a problem. And I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that, Look, it is a fact that they are under threat from the Yemen side of the border with missiles from Iran. That is just a fact. I'm not saying that that justifies... Well, it's also justifies, a fact that civilians uh, are being killed. And I'm not saying that that fact justifies civilian casualties. I'm simply trying to put your answer into some context here. But obviously we're very concerned right. about what happened over the weekend. We wouldn't have issued that very strong statement okay. if, we, if, we, if we didn't Do you know if there's been any interagency discussion on the re about, the review, about this review? Yes, there has there been. There has been already, so it started. The review has begun. Well, uh, y yes, but it is, or is it this we one always, we, first of all, we so this always is one of these continuously things review. So this is a special system. review. No, 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 I'm not okay. saying that. Right. Again, trying to put this in context, some, aid and assistance to foreign countries is something we always review constantly. That, is this, that has been the case. It has been the case specifically with Saudi Arabia uh, in recent months, and I've talked about that from the podium. In light of the attack over the weekend, uh, in, in, with the scrutiny that that attack legitimately calls for, we are going to undertake uh, 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 additional reviews of aid and assistance that goes uh, to Saudi Arabia. And your question, has it started yet? Yes, it has started. Okay. Last, this is definitely the last one. Um, the Pentagon earlier just said that the, the U.S. is weighing its response, the administration is weighing its response to these missiles that were fired and landed near uh, this naval ship, U.S. Uh, naval ship. Um, that's obviously a military response that they're considering. I'm just wondering, is there any kind of a diplomatic response that's been uh, uh, being considered? And if there is, who, who exactly do you bring that presumably complaint right. yeah, to? It's a, it's a little bit uh, more porous situation in terms of uh, dipl diplomacy there in Yemen. Uh, uh, but I can tell you, and, and we, you saw this, I think, in the statement that was put out after the strike that uh, the, that here at the State Department in particular, we are continue to call on all parties to get to a ceasefire, stop the violence, de-escalate the tensions, and let's start moving towards a political track. And we're going to continue to work as best we can with and through the UN Special Envoy to that end. So yeah, there's, there's diplomatic efforts here, um, but it's not without its challenges, obviously in a place like Yemen. I mean, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the missiles that's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. In context, in context of everything else. But going how, on. I mean, you go but, to the UN. You mean you go to the well, UN well, to have them go to the people that fight? Well, well, we, fired we made a very public call for all parties, right, uh, to de-escalate okay. the tensions and stop, stop the violence. Obviously, to cease this kind of a uh, of an attack, um, and we're going to continue to work and by and through uh, the UN Special Envoy as he tries to get a, a cessation of hostilities in place uh, and uh, and to get political talks back okay. on track. Thanks. Yeah. Do, do you have a time frame on the review of uh, ties with the Saudis? No, I don't. Okay. And is it re a review purely of their recent actions, or will you also be examining whether U.S. forces are legally 
uh, libel as a as a uh, supporter of the coalition. Now, as I think the statement said over the weekend, it was a review of our aid and assistance to Saudi Arabia. So whether that's appropriate to continue? I think in light of the attack over the weekend, uh, it's the prudent thing to take a look at the appropriateness of the aid and assistance uh, uh, going to Saudi Arabia. But again, I want to stress that this is something we always do. I think that's an important point for people to understand that um, that in every case, all around the world, we constantly review aid and assistance programs to countries. Uh, but again, in light of this attack o over the weekend, uh, uh, we felt it was important to to state publicly that we were going to do additional reviews here of, of aid and assistance. Okay. But and I don't we, have a timeline on yeah, that. We saw the readout of the call to the to the Saudis, but were there any calls to the Iranians since they are supplying weapons to the Houthis? Uh, I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, uh, specific uh, calls to Iran on that. Sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, thank you. Sorry for being late. So I, I may have missed something. But of the this I didn't even notice because of uh, the okay. I'm, I'm the you know, harangue with Matt. Okay. I was, I was looking this way. I didn't see anybody. Well, it was very polite. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not a harangue. Like you want a harangue? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a harangue. Oh, I'm sure you could. <laughs> on the review. Could you just, you know, explain again how, how is it going to be conducted? How do you conduct this review? I'm not going to get into specific parameters here about uh, about how a review like this is done. I think what is important, and again, I want to go back and make the point. Mm. Uh, this is something we always do, constantly do it. Mm -hmm. um, yes, obviously, in light of the weekend's events, we're going to conduct some additional review, but it will be done in, uh, in the same interagency collaborative fashion that all such reviews of aid and assistance is done. I'm not an expert on that process. Um, it is a, it, it's a very inclusive process, uh, it, and it, it does involve all the requisite uh, agencies involved uh, in managing um, aid and assistance of a m military nature to, to foreign countries. Okay, so it is a routine interview, I mean review, sorry. It, routine, it, we routine will review. follow the same routine process. Okay, just, it is not routine okay. in the fact that in light of the weekend strike, we're obviously going to take I'm a harder look. say that it's a routine review that you would conduct any time that U.S. weapons are used the way they were used. The correct? process that we're going to use so, is going to be the same routine review uh, process we do uh, in other countries. So it is independent of the investigation that is being called by Ismail Wild uh, al Hajj, Wild al Sheikh, Wild the, 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 the envoy, Wild al Sheikh Ahmed. Ismail Wild al Sheikh. Ahmed called on the Saudis to investigate. Yeah. So you you don't want to wait for that investigation to be completed. You're doing your no, own. No, I think I answered the question in the mat. I mean that review is ongoing now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what do you? How do you expect that whatever uh, outcome this investigation or you know because it is being led by Saudi Arabia and the coalition, right? They are investigating themselves, correct? Yes. Okay. How will that likely to impact your review? I think it, we would. Uh, uh, certainly hope that it informs uh, the review process that we're doing, uh, but I don't want to make the review in any way, either in timing or result, contingent upon that. Uh, what we've said is that we expect a, a, a fair, thorough, uh, and transparent investigation. Uh, as we've said in the past, when uh, there have been incidents of civilian casualties uh, in Yemen as a result of Saudi-led operations, we would, we would expect the same thing here. Um, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm my last question uh, on this. So this review is just related <laughs> to the incidents last, you know, where the funeral was struck, was hit, independent of other incidents like schools no. or hospitals no, so and so again, on. Again, in light of what happened over the weekend, we believe right. that it, a review of aid and assistance to Saudi Arabia, uh, additional review if you like, uh, is warranted in light of what happened over the weekend. But as I also said earlier, it's not like we haven't done this in the past. When there have been similar instances, we've taken a look. Um, it, it's not, it, it, it's not, a, it's not atypical for us to do that. Um, so we believe that, given these events, uh, taking a fresh look at, at the aid and assistance that Saudi Arabia gets, uh, in, con in keeping with their operations as. Uh, as the lead of this coalition in Yemen, it is warranted. Okay. Yeah. Syria. Syria. We ready to move on to Syria? I have a question tangentially related to that. Tangentially related <laughs> to Syria or? Okay. So, How tangentially is it? Oh, well, Mozambique, we'll find, right? We'll find out. Um, an email exchange recently made public uh, of Secretary, former Secretary Clinton's uh, emails.
she speaks in tw August 2014 of the need in Syria and Iraq to use diplomatic and traditional intelligence assets to put pressure on the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which are providing clandestine financial and logistic support to ISIL and other radical Sunni groups in the region. Um, so that's soon after her being Secretary of State. It seems like she would be informed about what's happening. Do you, does the U.S. believe that Qatar, the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia are providing clandestine financial and logistic support to ISIS and other radical Sunni groups? I, I can't. I'm sure this will shock you, but I, I'm not going to speak about the veracity of leaked documents and um, whether they're authentic or not. I just won't do that. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are members of the counter-ISIL coalition and have been contributing uh, members of that coalition uh, pretty much since its, since its founding. Um, and we rely a great deal on uh, on their efforts to help us counter terrorism in the region, um, particularly counter this, this particular group, uh, Daesh, um, and uh, and we look forward to that those relationships continuing and their participation as active members of the coalition continuing as well. Okay, Syria. Syria. Our correspondent reporting from Western Aleppo interviewed uh, locals who say fighters in the rebel held east deliberately fire at civilians who are trying to leave. Are these people effectively held in Aleppo, in eastern Aleppo? I, I can't confirm that report. You know, I don't get into battlefield reports. I'm not going to do that. Um, what what is in, what is without dispute is that the siege of Aleppo continues, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, and uh, and you know, your question about being held hostage, there, there, there should be you know, and I've seen you know reports that they're allowed to leave. They shouldn't have to leave, and they shouldn't be being bombed by their own government and by the Russian military. And that's what needs to stop. That place, Eastern Aleppo, is is run by Al Qaeda militarily. How do you imagine people living peacefully under Al Qaeda? I think, uh, first of all, I'm not I'm not going to get into a debate about who runs what neighborhood in Aleppo with you. Uh, we've been clear, uh, and so has 65 other nations have been clear uh, that the threat of terrorism in Syria is significant, uh, pre predominantly uh, from Daesh and from Al Nusra, which is in, uh, which is we consider al-Qaeda al in Syria. And that's why the coalition will continue operations across multiple lines of effort, not just military, uh, to uh, degrade and defeat, particularly uh, Daesh inside Syria. Uh, so if, you're, if your question is, you know, how can people live under the jackboot of terrorism, I, 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 I would agree that that's, that that's not something we want them, a choice that we want them to have to make. They shouldn't have to, uh, to do that which is why the coalition is so focused on that group. Well, isn't the way to really protect civilians is to, to, to get them out of there? Because al-Nusra is not leaving, apparently. Neither are the rebels who are intertwined with them. And they're not likely to want to leave while they're continuing to be bombed. What needs to happen is a cessation of hostility, and the bombing needs to stop. And who's doing the bombing? It's the regime, and it's Russia. Is it the U.S. strategy just to let al-Qaeda run that place? Eastern I'm not Aleppo. even going to dignify that question with an answer. I'm just not even going to dignify it. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you, uh, is it, so is it conceivable that, uh, you know, elements of a Nusra could be holding members of the population hostage or at gunpoint uh, preventing them from I, I don't have any about? information on, on that side. But, but it, it, it could conceivably be that. Uh, uh, again, you're asking me to right. speculate okay. on a hypothetical here. Look, okay. we've been very right. – We've, we've been very clear about mm -hmm. the threat that Al Nusra poses, right. um, and that they are outside the cessation of hostilities. Uh, clearly, and what we've long said that if that if Russia wanted to contribute to counter ISIL efforts in a meaningful way, that that was a conversation that uh, we'd be willing to have and continue to be willing to have. But what they have proven uh, to, to want to do is rather support Assad, bolster his regime, and bolster his efforts uh, in this siege of Aleppo. So but, what you want is a complete cessation of hostility or complete cessation of bombing by the Syrians and the Russians, and then what? And then what, what would be the next step? Well, you're right. What we want is a cessation of hostilities. Okay. And I'd go back to February of this year when even the Russians signed up to I mean, exactly that thing. As far as Eastern Aleppo is concerned. No, no, no. I, yes, obviously no. we want to see the bombing and the siege and of Aleppo stop. Right. But more critically, we want to see a, a nationwide cessation of hostilities that can be sustained uh, over time so that we can get the political discussions back on track. Now, look, we had in, sep in September 9th, just earlier, uh, uh, well, about a month ago, right. you know, we had struck an agreement uh, uh, in Geneva with 
the Russians. That, you know, after seven days of reduced violence and the return of humanitarian assistance to particularly besieged places like Aleppo, um, that we could then begin to have a, uh, to establish a joint implementation center by which the United States and Russia would cooperate and share information to go after groups like al-Nusra. In fact, it was specifically designed to help us uh, together go after uh, al-Nusra. But we didn't get those seven days of reduced violence, and we didn't get any humanitarian assistance to any, in any significant way. Uh, and you know the rest of the story. We, uh, we regrettably, because of Russia's actions, uh, because of their intransigence and uh, unwillingness to, to meet their commitments under that agreement, we had to suspend uh, the bilateral cooperation in that regard. Is that agreement revivable? Is it revivable, that agreement? I think Could the, it secretary, be revived? the secretary has, has said that it is. Uh, absolutely. We suspended. That doesn't mean that it's forever off. Uh, and, and what we continue to need to see are significant steps by the Russians that they're serious about their commitments. And they have thus far proven quite the opposite. Yeah. Turkey's president today affirmed that Turkey will take part in the military operation to recapture Mosul and that Turkey would not follow um, the direction of Iraq's prime minister. In fact, Erdogan was insulting. He said to, to uh, Abadi, quote, know your own place. Your clamoring is not important. What is your view of this? I think as we've long said, uh, and I think you heard Brett McGurk say this himself on Friday when he was up here, all of Iraq's neighbors need to respect Iraqi sovereignty and territorial integrity. The, the Turkish forces that are deployed in Iraq are not there as part of the international coalition. And the situation in Bashika is a matter for the governments of Iraq and Turkey to resolve. What we support is continued dialogue uh, between them that can lead to a, spe a speedy resolution of, of the matter. We call on both governments to focus on their common enemy, our common enemy, which is Daesh. Uh, over the coming days and weeks, we believe it's imperative for all the parties to closely coordinate next steps to ensure unity of effort in that counter-Dash fight. The Turks today uh, played a clip from a press conference in which a body states in this press conference with the Turkish Prime Minister that he had demanded, quote, military intelligence, arms, and training support from Turkey. And it does seem like the Turks have a case that they were invited in. Uh, again, um, I'm not aware of those comments. I haven't seen that clip. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi has made it clear publicly that, that they weren't. Um, we don't believe, we don't hold them as there, there as part of the coalition, the international coalition, and we want Iraq and Turkey to work this out together through dialogue. Okay? Same, same topic. One follow-up, please. Uh, some local uh, officials, Iraqi officials, such as former Governor Nujaifi, also says who is coordinating with Turkey that the Muslim operation will be starting in a day or two and another timetable given by the Turkish uh, president also is saying that sometime between next week Mosul operation will will start is this your understanding that the, the timetable will be in a day or two or the next week the campaign uh, to uh, retake Mosul is an Iraqi campaign it's an Iraqi plan um, and an Iraqi strategy. Uh, the United States forces will support that as we have in the past. Other military operations conducted by the Iraqi security forces inside Iraq um, and like they have done in the past they will do it um, uh, at a time of their choosing when they believe they're ready um, and I wouldn't begin uh, to, uh, to speak to future operations one way or another from the podium. So when Iraqi Prime Minister talks about the Muslim operation he is the most uh, authoritative voice. Is this the understanding? He, the, the prime, it, it's uh, the, the Iraqi security forces report to the government of Iraq. Prime Minister Abadi, Prime Minister Abadi, uh, makes ultimately makes these decisions, uh, and we leave it to him to um, both make those decisions and then speak to them when uh, when he is willing to do so. And I'm not going to get ahead of him on that. Yeah. On North Korea. Um, so the 10th anniversary of the first nuclear test uh, came and uh, passed, but I was wondering um, if there is any sense of relief, or are you still on heightened alert for possible uh, missile firings or nuclear tests? I think we're always uh, vigilant to potential North Korean provocations. 
Um, and Danny Russell uh, earlier this morning mentioned that uh, there may be uh, further progress in sanctions. I was wondering if you had any further details on that. I don't have anything additional to add. I mean, we, but I think you, you, you may have seen uh, comments by uh, Ambassador Power uh, to a similar uh, point, uh, to a similar degree, talking about the work that we continue to do inside the UN to, to pursue additional sanctions. I just don't have anything to update with you on. And then do you have any uh, further detail about uh, next week's 2 plus 2 meeting? Um, other than uh, what he had sent out? Other than what? Uh, what he had sent out. No, I mean, uh, we're looking forward to the discussion. I don't have uh, I, I don't have anything additional to, to lay out for you. Uh, we'll obviously keep you posted if there's any schedule changes or anything. The Secretary's looking forward to the dialogue. Jenny? Uh, and this is the power emphasized that the uh, U.S. use all of the tools for the sanctions against the North Korea. Specifically, what other tools U.S. can use for the pressure to North Korea? Well, we, you know, we've talked about this many times, and uh, sanctions are uh, one tool. Uh, um, and as we've made clear, uh, their recent activities have galvanized the international community to seek potential additional sanctions. And sanctions take time. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not a valuable tool and they can't be effective, um, it, uh, but, uh, but they do take time uh, to work. I'm not going to speculate about uh, additional measures that uh, the international community may or may not uh, want to pursue, certainly not going to speak unilaterally for the U.S. in this regard. Uh, we believe it's important to continue to work through the U.N. and with the international community because, um, because pressure applied from everybody, we still believe, is going to be uh, more effective. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, where these discussions take us. Does the U.S. sanctions include the humanitarian aid, too? Does the humanitarian does uh, what? Does what include humanitarian? You, your, uh, I mean, uh, U.S. individual sanctions include the North Korean humanitarian assistance. Well, again, so far, the sanctions that have been applied really are uh, against uh, members of the regime and, and, uh, um, and about their resources that they have. Um, and I'm not going to get ahead of the specifics of future sanctions. That discussion is ongoing right now, and I don't think it would be helpful for me to, you know, to get into speculation about uh, what they're going to look like and, uh, and how we're going to try to try to implement them should they should they be passed. But the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, he didn't take out of their people's, people's starving gas. He always think about, you know, the, the, the nuclear programs of their developed nuclear weapons. Why the uh, international you know, country should take out of humanitarian aid to North Korea because they're Neither didn't take care of their peoples. So what is your comment? <laughs> I mean, again, we're going to continue to apply uh, pressure on the North, and uh, we're going to continue to work with international partners uh, to do that uh, just as effectively as possible. I'm not going to speculate about what future, a future sanctions regime might look like. Obviously, we're working through that right now. Um, but stepping back from North Korea, and just try to try to address your question as best I can. Humanitarian assistance in a non-permissive environment, and I think we'd all agree that the North is a non-permissive environment, um, uh, comes with a lot of risks um, and consequences that you that that any nation state needs to think through uh, before you try to implement that. But he using that. I mean, Kim Jong Un using that humanitarian assistance, like a food. You know, South Korea send 100 cows to North Korea, it's gone. But uh, worse than beef, gone. <laughs> so why you consider about humanitarian assistance to North Korea? I, I, That's what I'm... I can appreciate the reattack on the question. I really think I've addressed this as far as I can go, Jenny. Um, but we're going to continue to look for ways to apply more pressure to the regime through the international community, and I'm really not going to speculate um, about uh, what those tools are going to look like going forward. We're having those active discussions right now. Mike. Thank you.
Can I have a quick follow up? I just want to make sure I understand. Um, so you're saying that you were saying that you were looking at the future potential sanctions, but but then you are not going to specify the detail. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so my question for you is, given the timing of all these related events, like ambassadors, Samantha Powers are, uh, was visiting Seoul, and then the next week we got U.S.-Korea 2 plus 2 uh, meeting, is there a uh, U.N. Uh, Security Council resolution in the cooking? I, I don't know the I don't know the status of, of a specific resolution, but as the ambassador said, I think just over the weekend that we continue to uh, work uh, uh, through the UN and with other members of the Security Council on trying to develop a, a new uh, package uh, of sanctions. Now, where that is in the process, I just don't know. Um, I would refer you to my colleagues up at the the UN mission in New York City. I just don't have a, an update on where they are on that, but uh, but we are actively having those conversations. Would that sanction involving the uh, the uh, this loophole to close the loophole of uh, the coal uh, transaction? Uh, again, I'm not going to get ahead of the, the discussions that are still ongoing. I just I can't do that. If I may, can I ask one quick one on Ethiopia? Sure. Um, I wonder if you have anything on Ethiopia. Um, the country has uh, announced a state of emergency. And then uh, how concerned are you regarding the escalation of tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt? Well, we're obviously very concerned. Um, we take note of uh, President Mal Malatu's uh, October 10th address to Parliament, committing the government to address some of the grievances raised by protesters, such as land rights and electoral reform. We encourage the government to act decisively on those proposals. We encourage the Ethiopian government to clarify how it intends to implement the state of emergency that was declared this weekend, particularly regarding the emergency measures that authorize detention without a warrant, uh, limitations on free speech, prohibitions on public gatherings, and impositions of curfews. Even if these measures are intended to restore order, uh, silencing independent voices and interfering with the rights of Ethiopians is a self-defeating tactic that exacerbates rather than addresses the grievances. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so it's been some renewed fighting. Uh, the fighting season is underway. And Taliban have made some uh, significant gains. Is this causing you to reassess uh, your evaluation of the government's ability to uh, exercise control in Afghanistan and reassess any of the pledges that the U.S. made, maybe uh, reevaluate the need to increase assistance uh, security-wise for Afghanistan? And how under threat do you see the government right now in the wake of these latest attacks? Well, we still have – we still have confidence in uh, in the Afghan government uh, to continue to move uh, political and economic reform reforms forward. Uh, the Secretary met uh, with both uh, President Ghani and Chief Executive uh, of Abdullah just last week in Brussels. Um, good discussions. Uh, we're, we're, so we're, we're, we're confident that, that they know the challenges before them, um, and that uh, and that they can work they can work through those and uh, can continue to enact reforms that can make a meaningful difference in the lives of Afghans every day. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, and it's certainly not made any easier by the fact that uh, that the Taliban has been more active from a, a military perspective than just the last uh, few weeks. I would say that that uh, is a surprise to no one, not least of which President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah. Uh, they're well aware of the threat that, the, that members of the Taliban continue to pose inside the country. And uh, so, I mean, this is obviously something we've been monitoring and watching. It's not altogether unexpected that the Taliban would act this way. Um, it is uh, ultimately, we believe, to their detriment in the long term, because what the real answer here is is political reconciliation, which we would continue to support. Um, uh, I would also note that Afghan national security forces continue to respond uh, assertively and effectively. Uh, it doesn't mean they win every f fight, obviously, uh, but they are engaged. and. Uh, and their battlefield competency and capability continues to improve. One of the reasons it does so is because of uh, the NATO mission there in, in Afghanistan, which, uh, as you know, the United States continues to support uh, with talent and with resources 
um, and I, uh, I can assure you that our support uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the NATO mission in Afghanistan will continue. I don't have any changes or uh, modifications to, to speak to uh, uh, today. Yeah. Can I go back to emails? Sure. Um, there's a report that just came out a little while ago, uh, an ABC report, um, based on the, some emails. Um, and, I, and I haven't had a chance to read it closely enough yet to know if it actually makes the allegation or just suggests that there might have been, there might be some impropriety. Um, so let me just ask the question that I think it hints at. What, in the wake of the, um, the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, did the department um, give preference to people or companies that donated, that had donated to the Clinton Foundation in terms of um, contracts to help Haiti recover from now, the earthquake? We looked into this with this uh, when the uh, when ABC was working this story, we found no evidence that uh, preferential treatment was given to any uh, particular entity or organization with respect to, to contracts. So, in other words, you're saying that although these emails show that people were flagged as being friends of the former president or their companies, uh, were they your you look your review found that that didn't actually translate into into any uh, right. Right. In, in preparing our response for that story, we right. looked into that and didn't find any evidence that the preferential treatment or, con in a con or for contracts was, was given. Right. Um, but I don't think it should, you know, with President Clinton being the designated by the United Nations as a special envoy for, for Haiti, I don't think it would come as a shock to anybody that uh, uh, the people associated with or, or uh, friends of him or the Clinton Foundation would also, you know, uh, in a time of great need want to want to contribute but I see no evidence that any preferential or special well, okay that's yeah. not but that's not the question I mean these people were I identified or yeah as yeah. friends of the former president yeah or not and so you're saying there's no issue here with the people who were identified well, I can't as speak to staff being I can't speak to staff people who weren't time, identified but, as friends being sent to other places what no? What I again? What I'd say is, see no evidence that tr preferential treatment was given to okay. anybody uh, based on their association uh, with the Clinton Foundation or with the former president himself. And then, and then the other thing, which is unrelated to Haiti, but still has to do with emails, and that is um, uh, reports that say that or that the State Department cooperated in more than just a. Uh, absolutely essential way with the Clinton campaign uh, to let them know what emails of her emails, the FOIA emails, were going to be coming out and when. Is that is is that true? I mean, I, I understand that there clearly it was contact. I mean, there had to be for you guys to even get the emails in the first place. But as the FOIA, as the review process continued, um, was there, uh, did, did the State Department give the, the campaign um, information about which ones were coming and when? So let me just back up a little bit. Um, I, uh, I, I recognize that this is being asked, um, the story is being asked in the context of, uh, uh, of allegedly leaked documents, and as I mentioned, uh, yeah, forget about that. I, I'm, I'm not asking, that, but, I'm just I, asking. but I have to say it. I'm not going to speak to uh, the veracity of leaked documents. Generally speaking, when processing documents for release through the Freedom of Information Act, it is standard practice for the State Department to refer documents to private companies and, and other outside organizations, including the Clinton Foundation, um, if the department believes proprietary information may be contained in the documents. Um, Outside entities are often given the chance to review the documents and provide input to the department about proprietary information that may need to be uh, protected from public release. Um, so, uh, you know, I understand that. I read that response that in, in one of these reports. I'm asking something slightly different. That is, 
as these tranches were released, remember? Yeah. You know, at the, at once every month or whatever it yeah. was. Did the State Department give the campaign uh, notice of which ones were coming? No. Okay, so once the review that you just talked about was done, uh, once the, 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 the campaign had See it or the or the camp yeah once the campaign had gone through them and done are we talking about the same thing you're talking about Clinton Foundation I'm talking about the Clinton campaign yeah I so, gathered that so they 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 reviewed the Clinton campaign reviewed no. these no 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 oh they never got to see them no the cl the foundation because there could be proprietary information yeah uh, uh, we. It's standard practice for us to allow outside entities, whether it's a, a business or in this case a nonprofit, um, to look at it before it goes, uh, because of proprietary information. But ultimately, we are the ones who finally make a decision about what we're going to release. Okay, but but we, we we owe them that courtesy for proprietary information. You're talking about the campaign. My yes. answer is no. So they never got to once they get turned over the. Emails to you before when, we, first, when we right, released before it. before the FOIA review began. When you once you once those things were turned over, there was no contact between the State Department we, and the campaign. No, we don't. No, we don't. On the emails, we do not. But when we released okay. the email, I'm traffic, just wondering what the process. We continue is. to do. Um, uh, we are under no obligation, nor have we, uh, uh, given the campaign uh, a heads up or. All right. Specific, uh, uh, spe specific idea of what's what's being released before it gets released. Okay. Abby, there's a new report out today from the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, which uh, says that ISIS propaganda videos have substantially decreased in their production since its peak about a year ago. Um, I was wondering if you have anything um, to comment about that, but also what you would attribute it to. Uh, and um, yeah, what is your response and, and what do you I've seen the uh, reports of the report. I haven't actually read it myself. I know there's uh, people here uh, at the State Department that are that are eagerly looking it over. Um, so I can't speak to specific findings by this by the, the West Point uh, Center. However, the uh, the reports coming out about it certainly reinforce our own view that uh, that we have been making uh, uh, a dent in uh, Dash's ability to um, propagate their twisted narrative and uh, recruit uh, fighters either to come to uh, Iraq or Syria or to conduct attacks uh, uh, at home. Um, and we know that we are, we know that these multilateral and interagency efforts to, to get at their messaging uh, ability. Uh, is beginning uh, to bear fruit. We know that they're we know they're having trouble recruiting talent, and we know that they're having trouble retaining uh, uh, fighters, um, and they're certainly losing, continue to lose leaders, uh, as Brett McGurk was up here Friday talking about. So um, th we we know that we're we're having an effect on them. But I would also say, and this is an important thing to add, uh, nobody's spiking the ball on this. I mean, there is a lot of work left to do, um, and. Uh, this group has shown um, that they are adaptable and they're agile, and, and they are no less adaptable or agile uh, in the information space. And we fully expect that they will continue to try to find ways to, to disseminate their twisted message and to, uh, and to recruit. So we're going to keep at this. Uh, here at the State Department, the efforts by Mike Lumpkin and the Global Engagement Center are very much tied into this. Um, we know there's a lot of work left to do. Okay. I think I have time for just a couple more. Uh, say, I want to go to the Palestinian Israeli issue very quickly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on a couple of points, you know, the last six weeks I've seen a spike uh, in Israeli nightly raid uh, targeting Palestinian refugee camps. On Monday it was the Haida camp. They kidnapped eight Palestinian children under the age of 15. But this happens you know, time and time again. And then the Israelis say, well, the army is not involved, although the army was involved. They say it's a, po it's a police action, although they are not under their police jurisdiction. I wonder if you have any comment on that and if you call on the Israelis to release these boys. Uh, I've seen the reports. I don't have much detail for you, Saeed, on this. Um, uh, we continue to urge all sides 
to avoid violence, to take affirmative steps to improve the conditions on the ground. In general, we also believe that all individuals, certainly especially children, mm -hmm. uh, should be treated humanely and have their basic human rights respected. Mm -hmm. But you know, you always, and in fact, uh, you encourage and you, uh, you sort of, you supervise or oversaw the coordination between the PA, the security coordination between the PA and the Israeli authorities. Now, can you imagine a situation where a PA policeman could go into a settlement and do the same thing? I mean, why can't you call on the Israeli, who are supposed to be the other part of this coordination? If they want something, they could conceivably go to the Palestinian Authority and say, we want X, Y, and Z, right? Well, what we want to see are both sides show right. the kind of leadership uh, to and, and affirmative actions right. to reduce the tensions and to move us forward. But we want to see an, both sides do that. Right, but there is no equality of power on both sides, John. Again, I think we've made our expectations clear for both sides. So. Go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. Sir, you just, uh, this is not the first time that uh, Saudi Arabia targeted civilians in Yemen. And sir, always, you always uh, express concerns on that, never condemn it. So about this latest airstrike, will you condemn it or will you just stick with the word of concern? I think I'm going to let our statement over the weekend speak for itself, which I thought was pretty strong in terms of the, uh, in terms of the very serious concerns we have over this. And if we weren't serious about that concern, we wouldn't be uh, willing to conduct a review of aid and assistance to Saudi Arabia. Sir, sir, so far, Saudi Arabia has killed more than 10,000 civilians in Yemen and displaced more than 3 million people. And, uh, and most of us here in this room uh, know, know, uh, know this, that uh, Saudi Arabia is involved in the uh, Shia genocide all over the world. So despite their uh, war crimes like act, you are still selling them the arms like $1.15 billion. So, so why, why is that? Well, there's not a lot of opinion in that question, is there? I mean, look, I, I think we've been nothing but clear about our concerns about um, uh, some of the military activity uh, conducted by the Saudi-led uh, coalition. Um, again, if we weren't, we wouldn't have talked about it over the weekend and said that we're willing to take a look at our aid and assistance to Saudi Arabia and see if there need to be changes uh, going forward. Um, and, and so we're going to do that. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is uh, what we want to see and we continue to work very hard for is an end of the, to the violence in Yemen and a return to some political negotiations that can get us to a peaceful settlement there. That's what really matters and the United States hasn't taken our eye off, our eye off that ball at all. Okay? Sir, sir, I have one more in Pakistan, please. So one more question. Sir, in Pakistan, there's too much talk on a recent article published in Dawn newspaper that civilian government of Pakistan tells military to take action against Haqqani and other uh, militant organizations. So the, the journalist who filed that story uh, has been asked to not leave the country and his name is put into the ECL, the exit control list, means he cannot leave the country. So what are your comments about the freedom of press in Pakistan, especially in this case? Well, so first of all, I'm aware of the reports of restrictions on Mr. Almeida's travel. I would refer you to the government of Pakistan for information on that. Um, on press freedom, it's obviously an issue that we continue to raise regularly with the government of Pakistan, including our concerns about the difficulties and the dangers that journalists face there. Uh, we're concerned about any efforts to limit press freedom or the ability of journalists to conduct their very, very important work. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank Gotta go. Gotta go. Sorry.